Good morning, church. This morning, we will study the book of First Chronicles, beginning in or continuing in chapter 19. In our story here, as we go, as we study Chronicles, David is conquering land. He's conquering more territory. And when we look at history, throughout history, there have been many wars. According to some accounts, only 2% of history has been a time of peace. But it's kings or nations warring, fighting, battling against each other. And especially back in the older days, time of history, it was to conquer more territory, to amass more land <clears throat> for their people. I saw that Alexander the Great conquered 2,100,000 square miles of land in his lifetime. He was 33 years old, and he had conquered the known world at that time. We look at Napoleon Bonaparte in 1800, the French uh, warrior, he amassed 720,000 square miles. And then we have the more infamous individual, Adolf Hitler, 1,370,000 square miles. But they were all warriors, we could say, and we could rate them differently in the purpose of their conquests. Some perhaps evil, and others maybe with good intentions. But the reality is that all made an impact on society. And I think it's the same for us. Either we allow the enemy to take more ter territory in our own life, in the life of our family, in the church, or we push it back and we conquer more territory. Now David is on the throne, and the first thing David did when he entered the land was he restored worship. He brought the tabernacle back to its rightful place. And then secondly, he secured the land. He pushed back the enemy. We could say the enemy of darkness. He pushed them back. And only after that had been done could the temple be rebuilt. Solomon could not have focused on rebuilding the temple if there had been constant war. He would have had to deal with war. He would have had to deal with the enemies. But David pushed it back. And only after David had pushed it back that there was peace in the land could a temple be rebuilt. Now, we are the temple of God, and God desires to do a work in your life, in my life. He desires to build the temple in your life. And it's only after you have pushed back the darkness and you have a certain amount or element of peace in your life that God can really work in your life, that you can really work in your life. For example, Saul, the temple could never have been built during the time of Saul. In fact, the tabernacle was stolen because he was a man of the flesh. He was controlled by the flesh. And because of that, the enemy conquered territory. His land became smaller and smaller. He became a smaller person. Because he lived after the flash, he did not have control over himself. But then when we look at David, we see that David, towards the end of chapter 18, we see lists of names. We see names of men that he left in charge at the tabernacle. We see lists of names of people that he had in charge of his own household. We see lists of names of people who he had in charge of the military. He was a man of administration. He understood administration. And so it is in our own personal life. We must understand administration in our own life. It is important that we are people of worship. Like David, he brought back worship. That was the first thing before the flesh, before the enemy, before that could be pushed out, worship had to be restored. But in order for that to happen, and for, in order for him to conquer more territory, there had to be proper administration. He had to put right people in the right place so that there would be right strategies to fight the enemy. And it's the same in our own life. 
it's important that we are people of worship, but it's also important that we are people of proper administration in our own personal lives. Um, you cannot conquer the enemy if you do not have a coherent government or a coherent military. You can't. It's impossible. That is necessary, and it's the same in our own life. The Bible says in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. We are fighting against a force that understands order and understands administration in their evil empire. When it speaks here of principalities and powers and rulers, it speaks of different ranks of individuals all working together cohesively as a team to fight us, you and me. And we in our own life, what we will see here today in our text if we are able to finish or the, the chapters that we have uh, for us here today is that we see that Satan attacks from without. If Satan cannot conquer you from without, he will attack you from within. If he cannot get the enemy to destroy you from without, then he will try to, to initiate self-destruction. And see, maybe you can, he can get you to destroy yourself. Satan might have people gossiping about you, telling lies about you, uh, smearing you, whatever it might be, whatever way, form, or shape he can come against you. It could be and uh, maybe lost of a, even of a loved one. He can use that maybe in some ways, however he can. But he wants to destroy you. That's his aim. He always tries first from without. If that is not possible, then he will try from within. Maybe he can get you to destroy yourself. And that is where self-administration is necessary in order that God can build what he wants to build in our own life. If we are governed by the flesh, if we are continually living in defeat, the temple cannot be built in your life. That what God has for you, the purpose that God has brought you to this earth cannot be done if the flesh is controlling our life. And that is why administration, proper administration is important in our own life that we're able to say no to the flesh and that there is an element of discipline in our life. That's absolutely necessary for us to push back darkness and for God's purpose to be established in our life. In chapter 19, it happened after this that Nahesh, the king of the people of Ammon, died and his son reigned in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. So David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father. And David's servants came to Hanan in the land of the people of Ammon to comfort him. So King Nahash was a friend to David, and uh, David wants to so show some sympathy to this pagan king. It could have been two a double motive. One was to be politically at peace with this king. Could have been one. But also, I think David wanted to have friendships with other nations. It shows that he was considerate. And, and he thought of other people, even though they were unbelievers, even though they were pagans. He still wanted to stretch out his hand and, and show kindness to them. So he sends a delegation to comfort the king of Nahash concerning his father. In verse 3, And the princes of the people of Ammon said to Hanan, do you think that David really honors your father because he has sent comforters to you? Did his servants not come to you to search and overthrow and spy out the land? Therefore Hanan took David's servants, shaved them, cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks, and sent them away. Now this is really humiliating. If you think about it, they wore robes back in the day and then to cut the robe off at the buttocks. Kind of look like some ladies walking today, you know, out there somewhere, you know, half ways. That's kind of how the men looked, I think. Um, and, and so, and then they shaved their beard. In those days, a beard was something that was held in high esteem. People would even swear by their beard. And slaves would oftentimes be shaven, but men would wear free men would have a beard. 
So beard was, was really important. So, so to shave your beard was a disgrace. And um, so it, these men are really humiliated, and they, they, they make their way back and send messengers ahead. What has happened? And David responds, verse 5, Then some went and told David about the men, and he sent to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Wait at Jericho until your beards have grown and then return. Again, I see in this little verse here, I see kindness and wisdom in David. See, David could have used these men to whip up anger against the Ammonites. Oh, let's go fight these Ammonites. Let's, let's parade them before the cameras. Let's take them all uh, back here to Jerusalem. Let's parade them before the people and use them as a as an instrument uh, in order to whip up anger and, and David doesn't do that. He instructs these men, stay in Jericho, maintain your dignity, stay there, wait till your beard grows back and then come back to Jerusalem. In verse 6, when the people of Ammon saw that they had made themselves repulsive to David, Hanan and the people of Ammon sent a thousand talents of silver to hire for themselves chariots and horsemen from Mesopotamia, from Syrian and Makkah, and from Zobah. So they hired for themselves 32,000 chariots with the king of Makkah and his people who came and encamped before Mediba. Also the people of Ammon gathered together from their cities and came to battle. Talk about a fierce battle standing up against David. There's principalities and powers are standing in alliance to conquer David who has restored worship in the land. And that comes with conquering territory spiritually in our own life, growing in our walk. There's warfare. There's, there's the enemy coming in alliance and pushing back and seeing how they can cause damage and overcome we look in verse 88 and David says now when David heard of it he sent Job and all the army of the mighty men then the people of Ammon came out and put themselves in battle array before the gate of the city and the kings who came who had come were by themselves in the field when Joab saw that the battle line was against him before and behind he chose some of Israel's best and put them in battle array against the Syrians I think at this point, Joah begins to realize how serious this battle is. It is in all sides. There will be fought. There are so many of them. They can surround them. There's 32,000 chariots. And he begins to understand that strategy at this point is important. And he lines them up. He brings the best of the best to put them in the right places. And he encourages uh, those who are with him in verse 11 says, And the rest of the people he put under the command of Abishai, his brother, and they set themselves in battle array against the people of Ammon. Then he said, If the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the people of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will help you. Be of good courage, and let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near for the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. When the people of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fleeing, they also fled before Abishai, his brother, and entered the city. So Joab went to Jerusalem. So Joab forms two groups to fight the enemies, and at the same time, they look out for each other. They're there to help each other in the battle when it gets to fierce. So we see that he had good strategy and um, the Lord was with him and he conquered. And I think it's important that we are aware of Satan's tactics. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. In other words, in order to keep Satan from taking advantage of you, be aware of his devices. 
You know, sometimes there's something that comes into your life. It can be a thought. It can be discouragement. It can be a sense of defeat. It can be a sense of worthlessness. It can be depression. It can be maybe gossip. It can be slander. It can be different things that come against you. It is helpful when you understand if this is something that's from the enemy. When you understand that, you're able to conquer it much better. You're able to know how to attack it. And so discernment is necessary in our life so that we know how to conquer something. And sometimes it's just of the flesh. Sometimes it's just our own thoughts. It's our own desires. It's just our own weaknesses. It's, it's a lack of self-discipline. It's not necessary that it's the enemy warring against me. It's just, you know, I have a craving for sugar, you know, and I overeat. Well, that's not necessarily Satan. It's just my flesh. It's my desire. I have to conquer that. It's self-discipline. It's necessary. Um, and so you conquer that. Uh, one of the ways how that could be done maybe is fasting. Just remove food altogether and teach your brain, teach yourself to say no, even when you're hungry. If you have never fasted, I would recommend that you do so. If you fast the day or a meal or two or three or four or five days um, it, it helps you when it comes to self-discipline and to say no to the flesh it helps you in other ways if you can tell your mouth that you're not going to eat and you can do that for several days uh, then it, it, will, it will it will help you in other ways where the enemy might attack you I have fasted, you know, several days, three, four, five days at a time, but I have never fasted 30 days or 40 days. I respect people who can do that. To not put food in your mouth for 30 or 40 days, it, it's, it, I'm, I'm amazed how people do that. It, it's, uh, it's a lot, but it's, it helps you to develop discipline in your life, which is necessary for us to conquer the enemy. Because without discipline, you will not get very far in life. It's, I mean, even if you look at your work, if you don't have discipline, you won't get far. If you come to work at seven o'clock and next day you come at eight, 7.30, how long will your boss be happy with you? There has to be discipline. It has to be in your job and it has to be spiritually. There's got to be some discipline for us to grow in our walk with the Lord in order for us to conquer ourselves first and foremost and conquer the enemy. In verse 16, it says, So when the Syrians saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they sent messengers and brought the Syrians who were beyond the river in Shulfak, the commander of Hadadezer's army, and went before them. When it was told David, he gathered all Israel, crossed over to Jordan and came upon them and set up in battle array against them. So when David had set up in battle array against the Syrians, they fought with him. When the Syrians fled before Israel and David killed 7,000 charioteers and 40,000 foot soldiers of the Syrians and killed Shofak, the commander of the army. And when the servants of Hadadezer saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with David and became his servants so the Syrians were not willing to help the people of Ammon anymore. <laughs> well, I wouldn't either. After that sound defeat, they don't want to help anymore. And they make peace with David. David fights the enemy, and he conquers them. It says here that they come and make peace. Um... That is, uh, Hadadezer. When he sees that they have been defeated, he comes and makes peace with David. But the Syrians, he conquers them, he destroys them, and uh, eliminates them. And I think that's also in our own life. When we are on fire for the Lord, we could say David restored worship in the land. There was this new vibe of worship and fire for God. <clears throat> People were excited. There's one thing that the enemy would love to do, and that is, like the Syrians, David did not stop until they were completely defeated. But what 
the Syrians would love to do is come and make peace. Not in the sense that they would become his servants, but in a sense that let's just cohabitate together. Let's just kind of work together. Like the Gibeonites who came to Joshua, and Joshua did not inquire of the Lord, and they made peace with him, and they stayed in the land. And that's what Satan would love to do in our lives as well. You don't just, just come to church on Sunday, warm the seats, and then just leave. Maybe complain a little bit on Monday what went wrong in the church, and then come back next week for more. And if that is how we live our life, Satan won't bother us. He's okay with that. He can live with that. But when you are serious for God, and you are a person of prayer, and you are willing to sacrifice, you are willing to give of yourself for the Lord, and you're disciplined, now you're going to be attacked. Now he's going to come. Because he doesn't like that. Now you're invading his territory. But we don't have a choice. If we want to be someone that is useful in the hands of God, if you want to be a tool in him, we, don't, we are designed to fight. God has given us the armor that we need. And there is no other way. Retreat is not an option. It's, it's going out and defeat the enemy soundly and not to make peace with him. Continue building the kingdom of God. There are so many ways that you can fight, and one of them is on your knees in prayer. Fight for people, for individuals, for your family, for your work, wherever you are. God changes things through prayer. It's a powerful tool that we have, each one of us in, in, in our arsenal is we could say the missiles of prayer. These don't have a, hundred, a range of 100 miles or 200 miles. They can go around the world instantly. Just pray, and, and, and God is able to work through those prayers and defeat the strategies and the plans of the enemy. Now, in chapter 20, it says, And it happened in spring of the year that the time the kings go out to battle, that Joab led out armed forces and ravaged the country of the people of Ammon and came and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem and Joab defeated Rabbah and overthrew it. Now in those days, kings would go out to fight in the spring. Winter was too cold. There was too much rain oftentimes. So they would go out in spring. And um, David had just had a great victory. He feels that the, the coming war is a small in comparison. He just fought the Syrians. I mean, 32,000 chariots of iron. He feels he's, you know, he's, he's pushed him back pretty good. Let the others go and fight, and he stays back in Jerusalem. And it is during this time that David committed a sin with Bathsheba. It's not mentioned in Chronicles, and, uh, and he murders her husband. And I think that it's also something we can learn from. It's often after a great victory that Satan will have us defeated. Why? Because we lower our guard. There's a saying that says, idleness is the devil's playground. And David is idle. See, if he can't demolish our lives from without, he will have us demolish ourselves. And that's what I did with Israel during the time of Balaam. Balaam knew he could, uh, or Balak hired Balaam to curse the nation, but he, Balaam couldn't do it. But Balak knew he could never fight against Israel. There was no way he could defeat them. So how did he do it? He brought women into the camp, had the men sin with them. In other words, destroy themselves. If we can't do it from without, then that's just self-destruct. So Joab now conquers Rabbah. But we see in verse 2 that the decisive victory comes only when David joins the fight. Verse 2, Then David took their king's crown from his head and found it to a weight of talent of gold, and there were precious stones in it. 
and it was set on David's head. Also, he brought out the spoil of the city in great abundance. The crown is a talent of weight. It's 75 pounds. So a 75-pound crown of gold on your head, you've got to have a pretty good neck to hold that. Um, but it was put on David's head. Maybe he just, you know, for some, I guess, some photo app pictures, show a little bit, put it on and let people see it. He conquered the king. Um, but even after the great battle of the Syrians in the previous chapter, it was the next battle that brought the vast amount of treasures. Look at that. It wasn't the battle with the Syrians. It was the next one that brought all the treasures. Also, what we can learn from this, even if you have been defeated in the past, there is still a crown waiting for you. Dust yourself off, put on the armor, and keep going. David was defeated the enemy was able to do this to self-destruct. It really brought David low, and he paid for it. There were some consequences because of it, but he dusted himself off, he repented of it, and he kept going, and there was a crown for him. So that gives us hope that even if we have been defeated in the past, keep going. There are still treasures ahead. There are still battles to be fought. God has not given up. In verse 3, And he brought out the people who were in it, and he put them to work with saws and with iron picks and with axes. So David did to all the cities of the people of Ammon. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. So this is a picture of true defeat of the enemy. The enemy does not control David in any way. He puts them to work with saws and picks and axes. And I think it's the same in our life. When the enemy no longer controls us, we are now in a position where we control them. Um, we have the ability when we have self-discipline where Food doesn't control me. I control the food. Uh, social media does not control me. I control social media. The thoughts that come through my head don't run my life. I decide what I allow to go through my mind. I put them to work for me with picks and axes. They have to work for me. It's not me working for them. And so David has now defeated the enemy. And they have no more hold on him. In verse 4, Now it happened afterward that war broke out at Gezer with the Philistines, at which Sibekai the Hushite killed Sepai, who was one of the sons of the giants, and they were subdued. Again there was war with the Philistines, and Elphanan, the son of Jer, killed Lamai, the brother of Goliath, the Gitchite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again there was war at Goth, where there was a man of great stature with 24 fingers and toes, six on each hand, six on each foot, and he also was born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemai, David's brother, killed him. These were born to the giant in Goth, and they fell by David, of David and by the hands of his servants. So there were even more enemies. David thought first he could rest. No, he fought another big war. And now he has these individual giants to fight, these big Goliaths in his life. And he fights them one by one. The Bible says in Galatians 6, verse 9, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall re reap if we do not lose heart. See, David could have said, Man, I'm tired of this. Just keep fighting. But it's what God has called us to. He's called us to battle. And it's, it's something that we need to encourage one another. Just as Joab encouraged Abishai, his brother, he says, you know, be encouraged. Fight. If you are conquered, I'll help you. If you are conquered, I'll help you. And they helped each other, and they encouraged one another. And so this battle that we're in is, is a lifelong battle.
So do not grow weary. David learned this. I think he, he had to keep fighting. It was one battle after the other. Some were more larger and some were smaller. Some were just individuals, but large giants. But they were there and they needed to be fought. And so David and his men, they go and they fight. They fight not just for themselves, but they fight for future generations. It was the next generation that had more peace than ever before because of the fights that David and his men uh, entered into. I think it's the same for us. When we as parents, when we fight and we fight well, we fight for our children. It's easier for our children and for the next generation. There's a quote that says, all it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. And I think that is true. To step out and be bold and do what is right, even if it's not popular, is, is something that we see in David. David is a man that continually fights. We look at David, the life of David, it's not an easy life, but it's an intentional life. And this man conquers much because of it. Chapter 21 it says, now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Great victory and now a defeat. Do you guys get to see a pattern? Great victory, he stays home. He doesn't go to battle and he's defeated. Then he goes back and he fights again and he fights the big giants and the Goliaths goes back to Jerusalem and says and he's defeated we see the pattern that defeat oftentimes comes after the victory and again if Satan cannot destroy you through other people then he will have you destroy yourself by improper self administration verse 2 so David said to Joab and to the leaders of people Go and number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? See, a man could only count what was his. And Israel was not David's. It was the Lord's. He had no right to count the people. That was one. And number two, God had specifically instructed Israel not to count their people. Now, during this, there was a census that was done during the time of Moses, and they were to count the people, and there was a specific reason for it. But God could do that. Why? Because they were God's people. But David now is wanting to count them, not because God instructed him to, because he wants to see how strong he is. He wants to see how many people he has in his kingdom. When we look at the time frame when David did this, he did it towards the end of his life. I think David, at this point, he looked at what he had done he looked at all the, the land he had conquered, all the enemies that he had pushed back. And there was now a point in David's life where he wanted to kind of sit back a little bit and enjoy his success. He wanted to get a little, just receive a little bit of glory for what he had done. But God is a jealous God. He will not share his glory with anyone else. What had happened through David was not because of who David was, it because who God is. And if we want to take the glory that belongs to God, it'll come at a cost. I know a pastor who said um, that there are several ways how you will lose your ministry. Not you can lose it, but you will lose it. One is immorality. The other, one, the other one is financial unfaithfulness. And the third one is taking God's glory. If those three things are things that will destroy your ministry. It's not if, it can, 
but God will not share his glory with anyone else. If I take credit for something that God does through my life, that will come at a cost, and it comes at a cost for David. The Bible says pride comes before a fall. Verse 4, Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. And all Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. And Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. Verse 7, And God was displeased with this, this thing. Therefore he struck Israel. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done it very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to God, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. So God came to um, David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Choose for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies to overtake you or else for three days the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said to God, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercies are very great but do not let me fall into the hand of man. Now, David was not a perfect man, and the Bible points it out. But one thing that David had was that when he did wrong, he admitted it, he repented of it, and he bounced back and he moved on. And this is what makes David a beautiful person. Why did God choose an imperfect man? Well, I think it shows that God can use anyone. He can use you. He can use me. God uses imperfect people. You take a white sheet of paper, and all it is, you see white, but you put one little dot in, in that paper, and you'll ask someone, what do you see? And they'll see, they'll say, I see the dot. And I think it's how it is with David. This man did so much. But yet these mistakes that he made, we, we, it, they're, they're like a dot on a paper. And we tend to zoom into them. And we see just the negative. But look at his leadership. What he did to the nation. He brought it to the pinnacle. Look at the Psalms that he wrote that have blessed millions and millions of people through thousands of years have been blessed through the Psalms that he wrote. The music that he made and that the people that were blessed there at the tabernacle even that during his day because of him and his leadership. The restoration of worship that came through him. And the list goes on. So many things that this man did. Yes, he was imperfect. But the beautiful thing about him is that when he did make a mistake, he admitted it, he repented, God restored him, and he moved on. There is a, a verse in Proverbs 14, verse 4, it says, Where no oxen are, the trough is clean. Where no oxen are, the trough is clean. See, if we want to have a life that is just always clean, in a sense, we could say, do nothing. Do nothing. When you see, I've admitted it in the past, I love to see boxing. <laughs> and uh, I just love to see the threshold of pain that people can endure. But you, you look at, at the boxing ring and and there's two individuals that are fighting boxing and beating each other when you are on the sideline and you're looking at it you can tell the person oh do this hey beat him over here you know th this would be a good strategy and you can always correct the person 
But how about if you get in the ring after you've been hit a hundred times on your nose and, and on your stomach? You know, that's a different story. Once you've been beaten to a pulp and someone standing on the sideline can tell you what to do, but get in and fight yourself and see if you can do that. See, it's easy to correct someone and to complain about someone who's in the ring and we see their mistakes. But there are too many people that are standing in the sidelines, that are in the, uh, in the, um, just in the seats and, and watching, and there's not enough in the ring and fighting. See, this church... To make things go round in this church, to make it work, there have to be people that are in the fight. There's people who are mowing your lawn. There's people who are cleaning the church. There's people who are making food. There's people who are in worship. There are those who do accounting. Those, there are those who are at the PA. There's children ministry classes to teach. Um, there's evan evangelism going on. There's many different ways of how people can get them plugged in and, and help. Now, most of these people who are in this teaching uh, your youth, youth ministries, and many other things that are going on, they're not paid. Most of the people in this church are not being paid. They, they do it voluntarily. It, it costs them something. It costs them something. But they're in the fight. They're in the fight. But David now has three choices for the consequence of his sin. His famine, defeat by his enemies, or a plague. And he chooses three days of plague. In verse 16. Then David lifted his eyes and saw the Lord of the angel of the Lord standing between the earth and heaven, having in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. So David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell on their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who, was, who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Lord my God, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. Therefore the Lord, the angel of the Lord, commanded God to say to David that David should go and, er and erect an altar to the Lord on the trashing floor of Orn and the Jebusite, so David went up in the word of, of God, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan turned and saw the angel, and his four sons were with him and hid themselves. But Ornan continued threshing wheat. So David came to Ornan, and Ornan looked and saw David. And he went out from the threshing floor and bowed before David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this trashing floor that I may build an altar on it to the Lord. You shall grant it to me at the full price, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said to David, Take it to yourself, and let my lord the king do what is good in his eyes. Look, I also gave you the oxen for burnt offering, the trashing implements for wood, the wheat for the grain of offering. I give it all. Then King David said to Ornan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which cost me nothing. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for that place. So this is a, a piece of property that David um, purchases from Ornan. This is where the angel stood to with the sword to bring the plague on Israel. And this is the place where David is now to go and build an altar for the Lord. And Ornan, who owns that piece of property, which today would be the Temple Mount, that's the same place where Abraham sacrificed his son Isaac, or was supposed to, it's the same, it was the same place. Now this angel is there holding a sword, and now this is where David now goes and buys that Temple Mount and he, Ornan, who's the owner of it, he says, you can just have it. I'll give it to you. And David says this famous phrase. He says, I will, I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. 
and David, he pays him in today's money and or, or money, 1.1 million for that piece of property. So I think he gives him a premium, premium price for it and David builds an altar. And this is where I came in, what I mentioned earlier, that we serve the Lord in different capacity. As I said in this church, there's many people who are serving and most of them, it comes at a cost. They either have to get up early, come to church earlier, uh, stay later, uh, whatever it is, it comes at a cost. And my question is, all of us, are we working and serving the Lord? Either in this church or either outside, wherever we are. But let me tell you, if it's not something that costs you something, is it then really a sacrifice? If you just bring the leftovers to God that you don't need, is that a sacrifice? In Malachi, we see that they gave the leftovers to the Lord. They brought the bruised, the sick, the lame. They brought that to the Lord said, God, we don't need this. Just take it. That's not really a sacrifice, is it? Sacrifice comes at the cost. It costs us something. It's an inconvenience to us. But we do it. When my wife and I were married, uh, early on in our marriage, um, this is when we started this church, we found very early on in our life, couples that were married, you know, on Saturdays they were, had their day off, and Saturday evening they went out and did stuff. And my wife and I, we pretty much all day, I studied Saturdays, and uh, evenings we would take some time for ourselves. And then Sunday, I would be up early in the morning preparing the message for church. And after church, you're kind of a little bit tired, you know, because of your work and, you know, rest. And, you know, the others were off doing something else. And we realized that we didn't fit in very well at times. And, but it comes at a cost. It comes at a sacrifice. But it's a sacrifice that is, that, that, that it's not a sacrifice at all. When you really think of, the work that God desires to do in all of us, then it's no longer a sacrifice. It's a pleasure to do that. And my question to you is, are you serving the Lord even if it costs you something? When it's a sacrifice. When there's food to be taken out to maybe a sick person or, or someone that is in need, are you, are you willing to cook? Or when there's some, someone that needs to be visited or encouraged, are you willing to take off from work to go and encourage that person? It comes at a cost. I will not sacrifice on that which costs me nothing. So let's close off with verse 29. It says, For the tabernacle of the Lord and the altar of burnt offerings, offering which Moses had made in the wilderness, were at that time in the high place in Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. Now, David knew that Ornan's trashing floor, the Temple Mount, that's the place. That's where the tabernacle needs to be brought to. That's where we will build the temple. But he could not go, and he didn't want to go inquire of the Lord. Why? Because he was afraid. The first time he moved the tabernacle, what happened? It cost the life of one person, right? And now, it has cost the life of 70,000 men. So God is not playing. God is serious. And David knows he needs to do this right, approach God in the right way. He has to make a move, but he has to done it right. He has to think about it and make sure that whatever he does is from the Lord. So, in conclusion, we are in constant battle with the enemy. And they're difficult, they're hard, but oftentimes the hardest battles may come from within. It's ourself. And knowing how to deal with ourselves. And so let us do what David did. Let us keep in humility 
uh, an attitude of humility and an attitude of prayer. And let us serve the Lord even when it comes at a cost. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning and the beautiful scriptures and the beautiful story of David. And he was an imperfect man, but yet we see he accomplished so much for you. He was a man that pushed back the enemies, and because of that, generations to come were blessed. And I pray, Lord, for all of us, help us to be individuals that are selfless in our life and are willing to give ourselves to prayer and to, to work, to put our hand to the plow and to be in the arena ourselves and to fight for the enemy, against the enemy, in behalf of others and ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.